In this quadruple collection of chilling true 911 calls, you'll hear stories of murder, shark attacks, a tragic death, and the consequences of an extremely negligent sheriff's deputy and mother. Neighbors described 60-year-old Gerald Hardy and his 55-year-old wife Jolene as a quiet couple with a penchant for elaborate Halloween and Christmas decorations. However, the events of Thursday, July 16, 2009 would show you that you can never judge a book by its cover. Just after 4 p.m., Jolene Hardy went to one of her neighbors and asked them to call 911. Okay, and when you say he's down, what do you mean? He says he's, he's cold and he's not breathing. She says she's been trying to give him CPR. Okay. Is there any way you can get a phone, a cell phone, or something over there to him? Yeah, well, i tell you what, I'm, I'm giving it to her right here. Here she is, right here. Okay. About a year ago, they took police to stop me in the middle of the night going yeah. up toward Raleigh. Hello, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you get in there with him? I've been there trying to do mouth to mouth, but he's cold and stiff. Really cold and stiff. And I've been gone all day hunting for him because he's got a lot of mental problems and he likes to go down to Durham and Raleigh. And he was picked up, well, wasn't picked up, but he was stopped by the Apex police about a year ago because it was like four in the morning okay. and he was out there. Okay, so you're going to go to the gang areas and get killed because he doesn't want to die of his lymphoma. Okay. Do you have a cell phone at all, ma'am? Yeah, but it died. It died? Okay, what's your name? Jolene Hardy. Jolene Harvey? Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y. Okay. All right, at last you were with him. I'm just going to ask you some questions. How old is he? He's 60 years old. Okay. Okay, I, I have them on the way to you. I'm just going to talk to you while they're on the way. And I'm at my neighbor's house right now because I tried all that time to resuscitate him, and he's so cold and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I came over here because it finally dawned on me I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And he just got colder, so... Uh, yeah. Okay. I've been hunting for him all last night and all day. I haven't had any sleep. I've okay. been doing these things for six years since he got to live. Okay. Home. Last you were over there with him. Was he awake? No, he was as cold as a bone. And, was he and breathing? Stiff. No, he's stiff and cold as a bone. And I went and blew in his mouth and, and nothing happened because his chest don't rise or nothing because he's already cold. Okay. Yeah. Do you think he's beyond any help? Oh, God, yes. Okay. I've never seen a dead person outside of a coffin. Okay. And then I had to put my mouth on his, and it was so cold, and he, he's got his teeth all knocked out, his, and he's all beat up looking. His teeth are knocked out, and he's beat up looking? Yes, because he hangs out. Sometimes he goes down to Ralph in the room. And he walks, and one time a year ago, we saw the Apex cops, so I'm at four in the morning heading toward Raleigh, and they stopped him and talked to him, and he said, is there a law against me walking down the street at four in the morning? And they said, well, no, and he said, well, I'm not a window peeper or nothing, and okay, uh, can't okay. I be on my way? And they said, yeah. Jolene, when's the last time you saw him? I saw him early. This morning, or not this morning, yesterday morning. And then he took off somewhere, evidently, that evening. When's the last time did, you were home? The la I, <laughs> last time I was home. Yes, ma'am. I've been out all night looking for him, and all day looking for him. Okay. And I got my house at my house about 3, I'm guessing about 3.30. 3.30 this morning? No, no, this afternoon. Okay. Before 3.30 this afternoon, when yeah, the last I time out. you were physically home? At what time? When is the last time you were home? Inside? Last, yes. The last time I was home? Uh-huh. I was home once early morning, and he wasn't there then. But when I come back now, he... Okay, and you've been doing CPR since you came at 3.30? What's that? 
You've been doing CPR. Yes, I have. Thirty. But I got uh, I got um, heart condition and high blood pressure and cholesterol, and I got sugar diabetes a little bit, and I couldn't breathe deep enough. But I mean, he was already stiffing cold, so he's been laying there. He had to come home sometime in the morning time, or the, you know, not early morning, but later morning. Cause I just went in there about I guess it was three thirty. Okay, is that an ambulance I hear pulling up? Yes, they're here. I'll okay, go ahead and talk to them. Go talk to them. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. When the police arrived, they found Gerald Hardy lying on the kitchen floor with what court documents described as obvious signs of rigor mortis setting in. The clearly deceased man had been beaten, his front teeth were broken, and several cuts and tears were visible on his head. Wake County Sheriff Donnie Harrison told local news station WRAL, Then we saw things that did not look right, and it turned out to be a homicide. Investigators collected evidence from the scene, including a 10-inch pipe, a laptop, and blood samples from paper towels found in the home. Two vehicles were also taken from the residence. Police arrested Jolene Hardy early the following day and charged her with murder. The state chief medical examiner performed an autopsy in Chapel Hill, which revealed further lacerations and abrasions to her husband's chest and back and fractures to four of the victim's ribs. The internal examination showed blood around the skull and swelling to his brain, both signs of head trauma. Gerald Hardy's cause of death was recorded as a result of complications from blunt force trauma secondary to beating. When questioned by police, Jolene dropped her story of Gerald walking through gang areas with the hope of being killed and confessed to killing her husband. She told officers that she and Gerald had gotten into a fight and she had hit him in his face, head, and body with a hammer. She said he had lost consciousness and she had cleaned his body and blood from the scene. Jolene and Gerald had two sons and a daughter and lived in the exclusive Perny Court in the town of Apex in Wake County, North Carolina. Despite Jolene's claims that her husband had lymphoma, Gerald's family hadn't heard anything about him having any serious illness. One of his relatives who remains anonymous told WRAL that the couple had been having marital problems for five years before Gerald was killed. She said Gerald had cut ties with his friends and family in an attempt to work on the marriage. My brother had tried very hard to uh make his marriage work. He, he, that's why he gave up his family and his job and all the friends he had before he married. Just over a year before Gerald was killed, he filed a quit deed and gave ownership of the home to Jolene Hardy for $1. A quit deed is a method of transferring property ownership that is mainly used during a divorce. However, neither Jolene nor Gerald had filed for divorce. On July 17th, the accused husband killer appeared in court, faced with charges of murder. She seemed to be indecisive. When the judge asked if she needed an attorney, Jolene mumbled, I heard you should hire your own, but I don't know. The judge appointed her a lawyer and denied her bail. In December the following year, a judge ruled that Jolene Hardy was incompetent to stand trial for the murder of her husband. Strangely, Nothing else was reported about Jolene or Gerald Hardy until Thomas' funeral home in Fuquay, Varina, North Carolina, documented that Jolene had died at age 68 on December 1, 2021. For more incredible 911 calls, subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up so you don't miss the next one. In what was to become known as the Summer of the Shark, two children were attacked on the same day. Both kids were in shallow water on the same Oak Island beach in North Carolina in June 2015, and they each lost an arm. The first attack happened around 4.15 p.m., and the victim was 12-year-old Kirsten Yao from Asheboro, a city about 200 miles inland from the beach where the incident occurred. Her injuries were so severe that an airlift was requested to get her to the hospital. Transfer status is Karen. Karen, this is Joppa, the 911 center. Can you advise the status on the air link? Yeah, we're getting ready to launch them right now. Okay, the left arm is completely missing and also a bite to the left, left leg, 13-year-old, weak pulse. 
Kirsten's mother, Lori Yao, told WWAY3 News she was swimming, felt a bump to her leg, reached back, and realized what was happening. She punched the shark three times, and the next thing she knew, she had been pulled underwater either by a wave or the shark. She isn't sure which. When she was able to swim above water, she realized he was gone, and the only thing she could think was to get to the shore before it came back. In a twist of fate that likely saved the 12-year-old's life, Marie Hildreth, a paramedic with Novant Health in Charlotte, was vacationing with her family on the beach. And upon hearing shouts of, Shark! She ran to help. The shark had bitten Kirsten's left hand off completely and had taken a chunk out of her left leg. In a news release from Novant Health, the off-duty EMT said, It was much worse than I expected, adding that the girl had severe arterial bleeding. Hildreth used strings from a boogie board and guy ropes from a beach tent to make tourniquets to stem the bleeding. Her brother-in-law, a Maryland police officer, and her younger brother, who was then an aspiring firefighter, assisted her until the Oak Island Fire and Rescue Department arrived. One of the first on-duty paramedics at the scene, Tracy Carnes, told CNN, the outpouring of help from the bystanders was amazing. Yao had been in the water around the Ocean Crest Pier, which is a popular fishing spot. When then-mayor, Betty Wallace, informed her community of the attack via Facebook, some local residents began to speculate that the shark had been attracted to the shallow waters because of bait thrown during chumming. Chumming is the practice of throwing small fish and meat into an open water to draw and then more easily catch other marine life. Because of the danger of attracting sharks, chumming is illegal in some U.S. states. Less than 90 minutes later, about two miles further along the beach, 16-year-old Hunter Treshel from Colorado Springs was swimming when he was attacked, and a shark had bitten off his arm above the elbow. Sunset County, now all the time for your emergency. Oh my God! Hello. Okay? Okay. If it's safe to do so, tell everyone to steer clear and, you know, 
keep themselves protected, all right? He does. He's got three people around him that's holding pressure to us all. Okay, listen, tell them do not use a tourniquet. I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding. Listen carefully to make sure we do it right. Tell them to make sure they have a clean, dry cloth or towel and place it right on the wound. Do what now? Tell them to take a tell them to take a clean, dry cloth or towel and place it right on the wound. They do. They have that right. Okay. Now. Make sure they tell them to press down firmly and to not pull up the cloth to look at it. They they are. Okay, if you can, just tell them to let him rest in the most comfortable position and keep reassuring him that help is on the way to him, okay? There is any talking to him right now. Okay, just tell them that help's on the way. Tell them not to give him anything to eat or drink. We've got several units on the way to you, okay? we got the ambulance coming right now. Okay, if you can, have someone meet the paramedics and guide them down to him, okay? They are. We've got somebody, like four people. Okay, like I said, man, we've got several units on the way. If he should get worse in any way, give us a call back immediately for further instructions. So we got several units on the way to you. We're here right now. All right, right thank you. you. Have a good day. Similarly, bystanders were paramount in providing Treshel emergency first aid until first responders took over. Witness Randy Milligan was one of the people who helped. Randy Milligan charged into help. I tore off my shirt and I tied it around his arm and I had a, he was screaming, is this real and is this a movie? The teen kept screaming while Milligan, along with other beachgoers, laid him on the sand and tried to calm him down. At the same time, another man tied his belt around Hunter's arm to stop the bleeding. When Treshel was attacked, Yell was still on the beach being tended by Oak Island Fire and Rescue Department. Some of the same first responders treated both victims at the beach before both victims were airlifted to New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington. They both arrived in critical conditions and were rushed into surgery. Yao's left arm was amputated just below the elbow, and surgeons did their best to treat her severely injured leg. Despite what we see in movies such as Jaws, it's not typical to shut down the beach or evacuate the waters after a shark attack, so the beach remained open. The Brunswick County Sheriff's Office sent its helicopter, Air One, to monitor the coastline and keep a lookout for sharks in the area. The spokesperson for the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office, Emily Flax, said, They're keeping a careful watch on the shore, making sure if they do see a shark that they alert the town. They spotted one shark, possibly a bull or tiger shark that looked about seven to eight feet long, and a local spotted and photographed another shark in the area. Not surprisingly, following the attacks, the beach was usually quiet. The attacks happened on Sunday the 14th, and Treshel was released from the hospital less than a week later on Thursday the 19th. Meanwhile, Yale was transferred to UNC Medical Center in Chapel Hill. Her parents, Brian and Lori Yao, released a statement saying, she has a long road to recovery that will include surgeries and rehabilitation, but her doctors at UNC expect she will keep her leg, and for that, we are grateful. They went on to thank those involved. We want to thank the Good Samaritans and emergency responders whose clear heads and quick actions saved Kirsten's life. We also thank her extraordinary doctors and nurses in Wilmington and Chapel Hill. This has been an extraordinarily traumatic event for our entire family. Over the summer of 2015, eight people had encounters with sharks in North Carolina. Postdoctoral marine biology researcher Chuck Bangley theorized that the unusual number of shark encounters could have been due to temperature changes in the water caused by heavy rains. He told the Associated Press, a lot of marine life are cued by temperature shifts, or they are cued by their food moving around. Six months after they each lost a limb, the two shark attack survivors met in person. Since her attack, Yao has returned to the beach but stayed out of the water. She told the AP, I still enjoy walking on the beach, I just don't care to go in water where I can't see what is coming. The now teenager was fitted with a myoelectric hand. The incredible device is an artificial limb that controls the electrical signals generated by their muscles. She underwent multiple surgeries to repair and rebuild the tissue damage to her leg. Although Yao had to give up playing the saxophone, she took up playing the trumpet instead. In 2021, Kirsten Yao began college at UNC Chapel Hill. 
Treshel also returned to the beach and was given a prosthetic arm, but he prefers not to use it. Just six months after his shark encounter, the 16-year-old was offered the opportunity to get back in the water with sharks as part of the Discovery Channel's Shark Week. He explained why he chose to do so to Good Morning America. So initially it was, you know, something I wasn't too keen on because as you said, it was like six months later. Um, but as I began to think about it, I thought, I started thinking about it as, this is not so much getting back in the water with the shark that bit my arm off, but more so it's like this great experience that not everybody gets to have. Um, and so that's just kind of how I viewed the whole thing. Uh, it was great. It was a bit kind of scary at first, I mean, as you'd expect. Um, but that was like maybe the first two or three minutes, and after that I really began to appreciate like, wow, these are some really cool animals, and getting to see them up close is really awesome. After high school, Treshel went to Grinnell College in Iowa, where he studied political science and economics. After a night out from having a few drinks on Labor Day weekend 2010, couple Brett McFarland and Catherine Kate Gill returned to McFarland's home in Mashpee, Cape Cod. In the early hours of Sunday, September 4th, Gill got up and went for a snack. Not long after, McFarland heard the horrific sound of his fiance choking and rushed to the kitchen. He dialed 911 and attempted the Heimlich maneuver. 911 recorded line, what is your emergency, police, fire, or medical? What do you need? You need the police? Your girlfriend shot you? No, she's choking to death. Okay, what's the address? What is she choking on? She what? Do you know the highlight? What is your name? What's the phone number? Is she breathing at all? No, she's not breathing. She's not talking behind me. All right, the ambulance is on its way. Hey, hey. How old is she? She's 39 years old. Hey. She won't open her mouth. She won't open her mouth? She's seizing. She's seizing? She's not breathing. Okay, she's not breathing. Okay. All right, what was she talking on? I can't hear you. She's working. She's she's in her pants now. Okay. What was she choking on? I don't know. Okay, you need to calm down, okay? The ambulance is on its way. Okay? Where is she? In the bathroom? No, she's on the kitchen floor. She's on the kitchen floor? Yes. Okay. Does she take any medications or anything? I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have no idea. She, she, don't do this to me, Jake. She, she, she's breathing. Is she breathing? You can't tell. You can't tell? Her, her tongue is swollen. Her tongue is swollen? Uh, How's her color? Uh, her lips are blue. Her lips are blue? Yes, they are. She said, the no way back. Did she, is, did she, does she have a history of seizures? We have no idea. You have no idea. Do you think she took anything? No. Well, we... I don't know. You guys just don't know here right away. Run! Run! She's barely alive. She what? She's barely alive. Okay. 
Okay, the evidence is on its way. Well, there's no way that. Please, don't take notes. Can you come to me? Can you Please. 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 Please.
through to the Barnstable County Sheriff's Department and was answered by trained emergency medical dispatcher Rhonda Colburn. McFarland and Gill lived just three miles from the ambulance station, so first responders should have been able to get there within minutes. The situation soon turned tragic as the dispatcher failed to ask for crucial information to help locate the home. The residence was on an unmarked road off of Jackson Road. McFarland had put up a sign that pointed to his house from the marked road, but Hurricane Earl had recently swept through the area and had torn the sign down. Despite a large portion of her job providing life-saving guidance in emergency situations such as someone choking, Colburn didn't ask if Gil showed any signs of getting any air or if she was able to speak or make a sound. Dispatchers at Barnstable County Sheriff's Department received 72 hours of certified training, and according to their guidelines, these were questions that she should have asked. Meanwhile, the ambulance crew had difficulties finding the property, and time was running out. Mashpee Fire Chief George Baker told CBS Boston, Our response was hampered a little by the weather, with a very dark road and poorly numbered homes and mailboxes. My folks responded as quickly as they can. It took six and a half minutes for the ambulance to arrive, and by that time, Gil had already passed away. Her distraught fiancé told reporters, Kate died in my arms. It's hard to think of anything worse than seeing someone you love die right in front of you and not being able to help, McFarland told CBS Boston. I tried and tried and tried, and nothing was working. I looked down on the floor and saw a big marshmallow with a big bite out of it, and I'm like, oh my god. Chief Baker said it was very unfortunate a young woman died. Barnstable County Sheriff James Cummings released a statement in which she took full responsibility for the mishandled 911 call. The dispatcher who failed to follow procedures when taking the 911 call was allowed to remain in her position taking emergency calls. The sheriff's department conducted an internal investigation. Though for Gil's fiance said it was too little, too late. No words can express what I go through every day, he said. I miss her so much. McFarlane later filed a lawsuit against the town of Mashpee. It alleged that the town's failure to post adequate street signage at the entrance to the small road leading to his house, along with the inability of the EMTs to find the correct address, had caused both Gil's death and his emotional distress. However, Judge Rufo ruled that Gil's death's original cause was choking on the marshmallow she was eating, and the town wasn't responsible for the tragedy. If anyone should know how to handle a weapon safely, it's a cop. However, on the night of Saturday, October 29, 2016, this wasn't the case. Lincoln County Sheriff's Deputy Misty Flowers was hosting a Halloween party for some friends at her home on Loop Road in North Carolina. The 38-year-old was showing her service weapon to her friends when she accidentally discharged the gun. The bullet tore through the wall and shot her 11-year-old daughter in the abdomen. Lincoln County now. What's the address? What's the address? What's the address? All right, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am. All right. Um, there's a young cow here. She has been shot by a firearm. Her stomach is bleeding out. 
Okay, repeat the address to make sure I have it right. I'll stand at the end of the road. Bring What's your emergency name? vehicle. <laughs> okay, the parents here, the parents here are, uh, Okay, what's the phone number that you're calling from? My number is... Okay, are you with the child now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm calling in. Are you with the child now? Um, well, her parents are with her. Her parents are with her. They're holding her. What, what's the thing for us to do then? Okay, just apply pressure to the wound. How old is she? Well, she's, she's probably in her mid... She's probably about 10 or 12 years old. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, 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 Is she hey, awake? Hey. Uh, listen, apply pressure to the wound. Is hey. she awake? Is she conscious? Yes, ma'am. Is she awake? Get some towels and apply pressure to the wound. Is she awake? No, no, no. I got it, I got it. Is she awake? She's awake. She's just Is in a lot of pain. Is she breathing? Yes, she's breathing. She's been shot in the stomach. Okay. Get some towels. When did this happen? How long ago? Just now. I called you as soon as it happened. Okay. Who's daughter? Is that, are they nearby? Um, it was an accident. I'm not sure who shot her. I'm really not sure who shot her. It was just an accident. Okay. Somebody was somebody All was right. playing with a firearm. Okay. And, and shot her. Is she is she completely alert? Is she responding appropriately? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, she's she's alert. She's been shot in the stomach, man. Is there more? Okay. Is there more than one wound? Is it just one wound? No, just one wound, man. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Be on the way to you. Just stay on the line. I'm going to tell you what to do, okay? Please get somebody here. They're, okay. they're on the way to you. Reassure her that helps on the way. Need ice, need a rag. What do I need to do? You need a clean, dry cloth, and you need to apply pressure. Okay, we've been applying pressure. Applying if, she, pressure. if she bleeds through that, just put another one on top of it. Bleeds. Okay, just apply pressure on top of it. Don't take it. Don't take it off. Just apply it on top of it. I know it's hard to stay calm, but you're doing really good. Don't give her anything to eat or drink. I'm sorry people are hollering at you. I'm sorry. You're fine. You are fine. I understand. It's really scary. She's bleeding very bad, man. Just keep the cloth on there. If she bleeds through it, just put another one on top of it and just keep holding pressure on it, okay? Where's the gun? Where's the gun? The gun is put up, ma'am. I mean, the gun is put up. It was an accident. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to find out where it's at. Just keep pressure on Emergency traffic. Uh, the sheriff is here and hollering emergency traffic. You said what? It's her daughter. The, the sheriff, there's a sheriff here and it's her daughter. Okay, I understand that. You told me that. That's fine. But just keep pressure on the wind. This is what I'm concerned about right now. If she bleeds through that cloth, get another cloth and put it on top of that. And... Do not take that cloth off. Just put another cloth on top of it. Just hold it as tight as possible. It's not going to be comfortable for her, but we're trying to stop the bleeding, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're doing really good. You're doing really, really good. Okay, I won't I won't go far because no, of the serious. I, I'm, I'm trying to be... You're doing good. I'm so scared, but I'm trying to be calm, but I won't go fast because I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just very scared, but... Okay. Is there a cop? Okay, there's an officer here. Is, is, it... is it another officer that's on the scene other than her? I, I'm not sure. Did, did the officer come? They're, they're on the way. There's an officer. No way. No way, madam. Just make sure somebody's out there to wave them down, okay? You're doing really good. They're coming, they're, they're coming, they're coming. They're coming. Right, listen, listen, listen. I understand uh, they're upset and they're just, but you're, you're telling me to stay calm. You're telling that's, me to stay calm. That's fine. Coming, they're coming. That's fine that they're upset. It's okay. It's understandable. Right. But you tell me they're coming. She's, I mean, so. Let them come. No, no. I know you're upset.
All right, they're putting her in a toss call, I think. I don't know what they're doing. No, tell him to leave. Tell him to leave him there. Tell him to leave her there. Tell them to leave her there. We have paramedics. We have the fire department. We have everybody on the way there. They need to leave her there. Listen, there, uh, there's an officer here. So how far do you have an EPA on the uh, emergency vehicle? No, I don't, but they need to leave her there. Okay, there's an officer here, and they're, they're discussing it. Responding deputies arrived at their colleague's Loop Road home at 11.23 p.m. and provided first aid. The careless cop's daughter was rushed to hospital in Lincoln, and then she was then airlifted to the larger Carolinas Medical Center in Charlotte for surgery. Neighbors knew something was wrong when emergency vehicles began to fill their street. The following day, local resident Clyde Queen told WBTV, my granddaughter was there until about five minutes until 11 last night. Being hard of hearing, next door neighbor, Joanne Helms, hadn't heard the gunshot, and knowing that a few children were present at the party, she shared her first thoughts with WBTB, saying, Maybe one of the kids got hurt because they had a Halloween party, and there was running around. When she heard that her neighbor's daughter had been shot, she wondered if the shooter had been caught. Had the David caught the one that done it? She was shocked to learn that the child had been shot by her own mother. Oh, I... I don't know what to say. <laughs> right now, I don't, want to, I don't want to talk no more. Flowers worked as a deputy at the Lincoln County Courthouse for less than 18 months, and she previously worked for the Catawbah County Sheriff's Office. Yet, she failed to follow the four rules of basic firearm safety, which are, one, always treat a gun as if it were loaded. Two, never point a firearm at anything unless you intend to shoot it. Three, Keep your fingers off the trigger until you are ready to shoot. 4. Know your target and what is beyond it. Arguably, Flowers fail to abide by all four of these rules, and on top of that, police officers are required to keep their service weapons securely locked away when not at use and when in officers' homes. After hearing of such inexcusable behavior of one of his off-duty deputies, Lincoln County Sheriff David Carpenter fired Flowers the following Monday for gross negligence. He then released the following statement. I find gross negligence and the disregard for the safety of others was displayed in the incident Saturday night, and therefore Officer Flowers was terminated today. This is totally separate from the SBI investigation into the incident that occurred at her residence. The sheriff continued. During this entire situation, my focus has been on the well-being and condition of the child involved, and am of the understanding the child is going to be okay after the surgery. This is a very tragic situation for all involved, the officer, her family, her career, and everyone that has been touched by this. We continue to pray for healing of the child and the entire family as the investigation continues over the next several days. Thankfully, after emergency surgery, the 11-year-old's condition was stabilized. The Sheriff's Office policy states that members shall ensure that all office-issued approved firearms and ammunitions are locked and secured while in their homes, vehicles, or any other area under their control, and in a manner that will keep them inaccessible to children and others who should not have access. Further on, the policy warns, members should be aware that negligent storage of a firearm could result in civil and criminal liability. The SBI. North Carolina's State Bureau of Investigation 
began investigating the case. However, it seems that losing her job and having to live with the fact that she shot her own daughter was enough of a punishment, as there is no record of any criminal charges being pursued. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting, and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.